if you remember anything, if you remember anything about the sermon today, I hope you remember something that is obvious from both of the passages that, that were selected for our reflection. It is this. Humans do not manage the Spirit of God. Let me say that again. Humans do not manage the Spirit of God. I say that because we like to manage stuff. We like to manage stuff. We believe we are in charge. And we like to manage stuff. We are uncomfortable when we are not managing stuff. When stuff happens that we are not in managing, we have anxiety, stress. In Genesis, we learn that God has given humans custodial responsibility for the earth and all its creatures. We are divine stewards. We are trustees, if you will, over all that God created. But before there was a world to manage, we read in Genesis that, quote, a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, close quote. That's the second verse. Before there was any stuff for us to manage, there was a wind from God moving over all that we said was not, but God knew was about to become. Think of that wind from God as the Holy Spirit. Then recall that nighttime meeting between Jesus and that preacher, teacher, dignitary named Nicodemus that we read about in the third chapter of John's Gospel. You recall that Jesus explained Nicodemus what he meant by being born from above Jesus described the process in these words, quote, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. That's in John 3 and 8. I'll repeat the point a third time. Humans do not manage the Spirit of God. Now, let's go back to the text. And look at this passage, look at these passages from the perspective of this point I've made three times. Humans do not manage, I know I've said it four times now, the Spirit of God. But I want you to get this down because I have issues with this, hello, and I don't think I'm the only one. I don't think I'm the only one. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. Somebody looked in the mirror this morning and wanted to manage something God. <laughs> somebody looked in the mirror this morning and said, I need to be able to control this. <laughs> and somebody looked in the mirror and said, Lord, help me manage this. In Numbers 11, we read about a crisis in the ministry of Moses as he led his formerly enslaved Hebrew people. Malcontents, folks who just didn't want to get along with anything, folks who are always fussing about something, grumbling about something, malcontents among the people stirred up a complaint about the food service along the journey. You know, you're in real trouble in the military if the food doesn't make right. I learned one thing in the Army. You better make sure the troops have good shoes and foot, good food. Troop will fight real well if food service is on time and, and shoes work. But if, you, if, the, if the chow hall messes up, you've got trouble with troops. You've got trouble with the soldiers. The demands of leading thousands, hundreds of thousands of people overland were tough enough for Moses, but then he had to deal with this. This must have been the breaking point because at Numbers 11, 13 to 15, not in the passage we read, 
you'll find these frustrated, frustrated words from God, to, to God from Moses. This is Moses talking, quote, where am I to get meat to give all these people? The people complain because they're just getting sick of manna. They've been getting manna, 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 free now. They could boil it, they could fry it, but they didn't like it. They did with the manna diet. And so, Lord, here is this complaint from Moses. Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat. You hear that? They come weeping to me and say, give us meat. And Moses says, I am not able to carry this burden alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you're going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my misery. Close quote. That's a Moses quote, y'all. Moses, I'm sick and tired of this. I want out of this. I didn't breathe up these folk. I didn't bear up these folk. And now you ask me to lead these folk. I have brought them thus far and I've got to put up with this. They complain to me. If this is what I got to deal with, listen. Take me out. These are your people. You ever had that feeling? Hmm. You had that feeling? I'm sick of this. Lord, I'm sick of this. These are your folks. Everybody who's ever led anything, whether it's a family, workers, and Lord, truth is church. In church, if you're in church long enough, you're gonna have some folks you just get sick of. Yes, you're gonna get some stuff you get sick of, and you're gonna say, "I want out of this." Moses was dealing with a challenge that people in ministry understand to all to be too common in our calling. It's the challenge that comes from knowing, knowing, knowing that we are facing issues that are larger than our resources. The bills are bigger than the budget. Hello. Hello. Nothing new. Hello. The movement demands are larger than the membership. Hello. The work is bigger than the number of workers. Hello. The harvest is great, but the labors are few. Hello. <laughs> Only 24 hours in a day, and I got more stuff to do than I can get done in a day. Hello. And so at Numbers 11 and 25, we read that the Lord took some of the spirit that was on Moses and put it on 70 of the elders, and when the spirit rested on those elders, they prophesied. But two men named Eldad and Medad, and I don't know whether they were, they were elders or who had stayed behind or they were not elders, and we have two other men. We're not clear about that. But two men, Eldad and Medad, were not with the other folks who have gone out to meet the Lord outside the camp, and they started prophesying in the camp. And so when they started prophesying in the camp, they started preaching, praising the Lord in the camp. A tattletale ran outside the camp and told Moses, you know, there's always somebody going to run and tell something. If you ever think the church meeting was the first time folks started gossiping, no, it's there, there it is in the Bible. Somebody started gossiping. <laughs> there it was. He runs out and go tell him, El Dad and me, Dad, in the, in the camp, they preaching. You ain't licensing them. You ain't putting no hands on them. Ain't nobody had a boat. They ain't never call themselves preaching. That's the Griffin paraphrase, okay? And then Joshua gets into it. You know, Joshua is Moses number two. Joshua is head deacon. You know, Joshua is, is, is boss trustee. There's Paul. Hey, Paul, how you doing, brother? Good to see you. Paul and Mary Lee. I'm doing all right, brother. Good to see you. Joshua was Moses number two, and Joshua got upset because Joshua, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Joshua said, wait a minute. You need to tell Eldad and me dad to stop. 
You didn't tell them to be preaching in the camp. You're the one in charge here. They need to be checking with you before they start preaching. And so Moses is prompted to speak, wait a minute, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets. That I wish that everybody was preaching. In the familiar lesson we have from Acts 2, we read about how Moses, what Moses talked about actually happens. The Pentecost lesson actually is the fulfillment of Moses' wish. Because recall, after the Galilean followers of Jesus began to inexplicably speak in the languages of all the other people who were gathered in Jerusalem, talking about the works of God, Peter had to explain that they weren't drunk, but that God's spirit was on display. You remember what we read? No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. Hello, Baptists who can't stand about women preaching. Men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Hello? Here's the point. Here's the point. The spirit of God is free. The spirit of God is free to operate according to God's agenda without our permission. The Lord is not waiting for us to take up a vote. The Lord is not waiting for us to take up a collection. Hello? The Lord is not waiting for us to decide what to do. The Holy Spirit is free. What Joshua did not understand in Numbers and what the people didn't understand in Acts is that the Spirit of God is free. Look at somebody and say, the Holy Spirit is free. Now, now, look at them again and tell them, the Holy Spirit is free. And, and, and remind them that God made up free. Free is not our invention. We didn't, we didn't invent freedom. God invented freedom. And if anybody ought to know what freedom is, it's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is free to work through people we haven't chosen. Hello. The Spirit of God is free to empower people we haven't considered. And what we learn in Acts is, what, is that the wish that Moses uttered has been answered. God's Spirit has been poured out in the world on men and women, young people and seniors people who have no social standing, and folks who have social standing. God's spirit doesn't need a license from the government. God's spirit doesn't need a letter from the bishop. God's spirit doesn't need a vote from the elders. God's spirit doesn't need a vote from the congregation. God's spirit doesn't need us to vote a certain way. God's spirit works in divine freedom to do for God through people what must be done so that God's purposes are achieved in God's world. Indeed, hallelujah. However, look at somebody and say, however. <laughs> however, some of us, some of us are like Joshua. However, some of us are like Joshua. We are captives of our own thinking and traditional thinking about how things are supposed to work. You know, some of us think it's supposed to work this way. Somebody in charge that we know is supposed, usually including us, is supposed to do something, decide something that's supposed to make something happen, and then the rest of us are supposed to do it, and God and we will, we're going to pray, and then God blesses it. That's the way we think, right? If we get together and decide something. We'll get together and we decide on it. We'll pray on it. And then the Lord will bless it. The Lord can't bless it until we decide. The Lord just waiting for us to make up our minds. 
And when we make up our minds, the Lord decides what to bless him. That's Joshua. Moses, make him stop. You haven't decided they could do that. Moses, make him stop. Now understand, El Dad and me Dad are now preaching up the camp. We don't have any work that the camp is tearing up. We don't have any testimony that the camp is falling out. Only problem is Joshua and that tattletale who ran out of the camp said, hey, El Dad and me Dad are preaching in the camp. But Joshua and, and the tattletale got issues because they didn't get Moses' permission. Aren't you glad that God did not ask anybody's permission on what to do with you? <laughs> Aren't you glad that God has not asked any of us to decide what to do about you? I know I am. If some people could decide what they do about me, and, they could and, God, and God had to follow their orders, do you know what? I'd have been toast a long time ago. <laughs> some of us, however, are like Joshua. We are accustomed to God's prophetic powers being managed, rationed, assigned, according to ways we think, our plans, our procedures, our policies. And Joshua's reaction to Eldad and Medad prophesying inside the camp, outside of the presence of Moses, without Moses' permission, shows how we are preoccupied with our plans and our policies and our procedures, and that our preoccupation often overlooks the fact that God doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit is not managed. Our challenge, beloved, is to accept the fact that God's Spirit is free to work on people in ways we have never considered and do not even understand. God's Spirit is free to move where we never imagined movement was possible. That's what the resurrection is all about. Hello? You recall the resurrection is about we don't expect life in that tomb. And the testimony of the resurrection is that God's spirit is free to raise up folks that we have given up on. God's spirit is free to call folks we haven't considered religious to speak and act with prophetic insight and courage. And whenever traditional people like Joshua and us, don't just, don't, don't just pick on Joshua, we have met Joshua and Joshua is us. When people like Joshua and us become set in our ways, count on God's spirit to work through other people to do new things for love and justice. Let me give you an example. Yes, God sent young people, lesbians and gay men, and other people who are outside the mainstream, outside religious character, outside religious thought and practice, to do the love and justice work we see being done with the Black Lives Matter movement. Hello? The Black Lives Matter movement didn't start inside Ebenezer Church or Dexter Avenue Church like the Montgomery bus boycott did. The Black Lives Matter movement started in the streets of Ferguson with young folks, lesbians and gay folks and young people who were outside the church who said only Preacher, can we come to the church to have a meeting? Because we want to have a meeting session. Now, we're not members of your church. We just want to gather there. Now, some of us have such religion that you can't meet in our churches unless we're members. And look at how the Spirit works. The Spirit sends the meeting to the people who are not the members and then tells the people who are not the members, go tell the church folk <laughs> to let's have a meeting. <laughs> Hello. Humans do not manage the spirit of God. 
Yes, God is doing that love and justice work because the Holy Spirit is free. Yes, God is inspiring more, inspiring more women and girls and men and boys to throw off long-standing notions of male privilege about who should be leaders in religious efforts and otherwise because the Holy Spirit is free. So we have more women becoming preachers now, thank the Lord. And we have some men learning that, hey, I just thought I was the most qualified person. I'm not really. The Holy Spirit has other plans. Many people are like Joshua and us who are so caught up in traditional notions of authority that we can't understand how God works. This is how God works. The Holy Spirit is not bound to follow our notions of rank and privilege. You see, we believe that you've got to been in the church 1,500 years before we give you something to do. <laughs> Hello? Where the Holy Spirit always brings folks up and empowers them. The Holy Spirit isn't bound by our notions of budget, our notions of forecast, our, our sense of priorities. You understand, we can set our plan and the Holy Spirit can change our plans. Let me give you an example that will help you understand this, I hope. Think of the word sales, S-A-I-L-S, -S, sales, sales, like in sailboats, sales, sales, sales. Think of sales. Got sales in your mind? Got a picture of sales in your mind? We are God's sales. The Spirit is God's wind. Our challenge is to live according to the power of the wind, the Holy Spirit. Sails don't tell the wind when to blow. Sails don't tell the wind where to blow. Sails don't tell the wind how far to blow. Sails have no idea when the wind's going to come up. <laughs> But the sails are just there waiting for the breeze. <laughs> Believing that if we're just there, the breeze is coming. And if the breeze comes because we're sails, the boat got to go somewhere. <laughs> the boat can't stay where it is because the sails are designed to go where the wind blows. We have no idea where God's wind will blow us. We have no idea who God's wind will blow into our fellowship with us. We have no idea how God's wind will blow obstacles from before us. We have only this assurance. God's wind will blow. God's wind is blowing. And God's wind blows in ways that the Holy Spirit chooses to make prophetic changes happen in our lives. Now, God's wind blows to shed light, prophetic light, on unjust situations. Folks want to keep, it's amazing how folks been wanting to keep the, the, the Russia thing undercover. Mm -hmm -hmm. But the wind blowing. The wind's blowing, y'all. The wind's blowing. <laughs> Breeze is coming. And even when folks trying to keep the shovels down, the wind keep blowing stuff up. The wind keep blowing stuff. Folks, fake news and the wind keep blowing. You can't manage the wind. God's wind blows to use prophetic people to uproot traditions and customs and practices powerful people want to maintain. Folks said for 250 years, we'll always have slavery and the wind blew. And the wind blew. Black slaves didn't have any army, didn't have any money to buy an army, didn't have any guns, to buy, didn't have any bullets to buy guns, didn't have any paper to make messages, and the wind blew. God's wind blows to send prophetic people to disturb our complacency and our complicity about poverty and cruelty and inequality and any other oppression. The wind blows. God's wind blows us. And the paradox is this. 
that like Joshua, we who should be the most excited about the work of the Holy Spirit are often unhappy about the wind blowing. You would have thought Joshua and said, hey, they preached in the camp. We haven't church out here. They haven't church over there. But what Joshua does, he gives a face of the holy, the holy sour face. How dare them have church over there without our permission? God's wind is blowing women and gay and lesbian and transgender and bisexual people, people who've been previously overlooked, people who've been previously incarcerated, people who've been deliberately shunned by religious folks, folks who we said in the church were too something or other to be in the church. God's wind is blowing them to do stuff for God. That challenges unjust situations. And our challenge is to be good sales. God's wind is blowing. Our challenge is to be good sales. The first part of that challenge is to be, like all other prophetic people, amazed. You understand? The sail doesn't know when the wind's coming up, so the first thing is to be amazed. There's a breeze. I feel a breeze, y'all. I feel a breeze. Don't be so sure about what you know that you can't say, Lord, I feel a breeze. God's Spirit chooses to work through us. We don't, we, don't, we don't recruit the Holy Spirit. We are recruited. We don't schedule the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit schedules us. We don't organize the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit organizes us. We must admit that we are amazed. We must admit we are surprised. We must admit that God always catches us with our guard down. Mm. If you will be honest, the Lord has done some of the Lord's best work in your life when you were not looking. When you didn't expect it, and oftentimes when you were sure that nothing good was going to come out of it. Secondly, our challenge is to praise God for blowing on us, moving us, commissioning us, getting God's work for love and justice done through it. Listen, don't, 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 don't yield to the temptation to claim credit for what the Holy Spirit is doing. Sales do not deserve credit for moving sailboats. Let me say it again. Sales do not deserve credit for moving sailboats. Sailboats move because the wind blows, not because the sails are standing out. Anybody in the Navy can tell you that. God's wind blows us, and we shouldn't take credit for the wind blowing. We prayed up the Holy Spirit. No, we didn't. I was here before. We prayed that we're going to pray the Spirit down. No, you didn't. <laughs> the Holy Spirit wasn't waiting for you to have a prayer meeting. So the Holy Spirit could say, oh, I, I, I'm late. They're having a prayer meeting. I, I, I got to hurry up and get down there. No, the Holy Spirit is not about that. Without the wind, sails are powerless to move sailboats. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. Thirdly, we must also, as Peter did at Pentecost and as Moses did with Joshua, help other people understand that prophetic work is always done according to the ways of the Holy Spirit. It is always done according to the ways of the Holy Spirit. I'll say it again. It is always done according to the ways of the Holy Spirit. Joshua and the people who thought the Galileans were drunk and Nicodemus show that even church folk Yes, even religious folk are not accustomed to how the Holy Spirit works. Joshua had been with Moses a long time, but he wasn't, he, wasn't, he, he wasn't hip to how the Holy Spirit worked. Nicodemus had been walking around quoting scripture a long time, and he didn't understand how the Holy Spirit worked. Just because we've been in church doesn't mean we understand how the Holy Spirit works. 
One obligation of prophetic people is to do what Moses did for Joshua and what Peter did at Pentecost and what Jesus did for Nicodemus. We must understand, and then we have to help other people understand, that the Spirit of God is not domesticated. The Spirit of God is not house trained. Hello? God's Spirit is always free. And among other things, that will require that we admit we're not in control. I'm going back to my first point, right? Like sailboats, we're on the water for God, but we don't control the wind. We don't define how strongly God's Spirit will blow us. We can't dictate to God's Spirit when to act, where to act, or how long to work through us. We are not in control of God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit controls us. What a paradox. What a paradox. God gets God's powerful work done through our puny little vessels. God's Spirit is the powerful force that transforms our limited resources, our little sails, into amazing and powerful ways so that the boat moves. So let's think and praise God for that. Let's thank God that God's not waiting for us to figure out how to get it done. God already has it figured out. God just wants us to be ready. When the, when the Spirit blows. God wants us to have the sails out. God wants us to have the sails up and out. You understand, because if the wind blows and the sail isn't up, the boat will move, but it won't move as far. Not because the wind isn't blowing, but because the sail isn't deployed. So let us be obedient to deploy the sails and live in the powerful paradox of Pentecost today, tomorrow, and always. Because remember the first point? Humans do not manage the Holy Spirit.